Remember to check out sarahsnakeshop.com for corn snakes and corn snake accessories, including corn snake morph books, t-shirts, notepads, masks, as well as other things. Hey guys, Sarah here. So today I'm going to be doing the Lavender Morph Deep Dive for you guys. This is a redo of an old video. I put a poll up on my community tab and this was the one that was most requested at the time that I'm recording this video. So I am really excited to get this started for you guys. Uh, the old Lavender video that I did like last year or the year before maybe uh, will no longer be available to uh, the general public after this video goes up. It will be available for members only uh, and it's $2 a month if you guys want to join members. You can see some of those historical things as well as uh, some other things that I might post. I've been posting every single week for members only uh, more details about what's going on with breeding and egg laying. I'm also posting other things to members only such as lives after the live is over and stuff like that. So if you want that exclusive content, you're welcome to become a member. Uh, and you can click join under any video to do that. Thank you to my current members though, Jelly Dots, uh, Melissa, Raul, Alterna, Amy, Bridget, William, Robert, Other Amy, and April. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It means so much to me. You have no idea. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the Lavender video, like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. You know how it Goes. Lavender is a morph that has been around for a long, long time. It's a recessive gene mutation. This lavender hatched out in 1983 in Rich Zakowski's collection. Uh, Rich Zakowski has been the founder of a lot of different morphs, so uh, if you guys would like to learn more about him and all of the morphs and things that he has been involved in, just go to cornsnakes.com. It is one of the like best resources that you can find for corn snakes, and it's where I got most of the information for most of the morph videos, to be completely honest honest with you because that's where a lot of the historical data is right now and in order to keep that going I contribute uh, $25 a year which isn't much and uh, if I had it I would contribute more but I do definitely recommend if you can support them please do. So Rich Sikowski had a wild caught female and he bred her to a snow male. The female unfortunately passed away and there was one surviving egg and that egg hatched into the very first lavender corn snake. Back then though he called it mocha because it didn't hatch out with this very bright lavender color that we see in a lot of snakes today. Uh, back then, back when corn snakes were first being bred, a lot of the wild caught snakes had sort of this like darker melanin wash on them and you still see that in some wild caught corn snakes today where they're just darker or maybe just not as vibrant in color. A lot of the vibrancy comes from the selective breeding in captivity over time. So uh, you're gonna see a lot of this more darker color, less vibrant color in the more closely related to wild caught snakes. And that's where we were, of course, with the mocha corn snake. Not only had people not been breeding it for very long, like corn snakes in general, but the mother of this snake was a wild caught. So it didn't have that bright color. So he thought at first that he just hatched a normal snake. Uh, but after a few sheds, he noticed that it wasn't normal. Uh, and we're gonna go into exactly why it's less normal than he even thought back then later on in this video. Lavender did go through a few other name changes uh, over the course of its time before it was called lavender. Uh, like I said, it was originally called mocha, but some people called it chocolate. Some people called it cocoa, but ultimately because of the selective breeding over time, uh, a lot of people just decided it was going to be called lavender because it was more purple. It had that lilac, lavender, purpley color to it. So lavender is what stuck. And also if you think about it, lavender is going to probably sell a little bit better than something like cocoa. Maybe not, but lavender just sounds really cool. It sounds purple. And purple is just like a color that you don't see in a whole lot of snake species. So uh, when someone advertises a snake as lavender, they think purple and purple is probably going to sell a little bit better than brown. You know what I mean? So after many, many years of lavender being considered just like a normal color mutation that's maybe anerythristic or hypomelanistic or maybe a combination of the two, because lavender does, if you look at a lavender, it doesn't have any reds, doesn't have any yellows. Uh, so we're kind of like an azanthic, which xanthophore is the yellow tone that you see in corn snakes. Uh, you also see this like anerythristic because there's no red. Sometimes they can get like pinkish, like if you add red factor to them or peach, but uh, there's really no like yellow, yellow, and there's no like actual reds. And then of course you get the hypomelanism because there's really not ever gonna be true black on a lavender corn snake. And so nobody really thought too much about that until the 60s. 
scaleless gene mutation came along. I do have a video about scaleless. I will link that above if you guys want to go see it. It is quite fascinating. Uh, I, I really like the concept of the scaleless gene and what it has done specifically to lavender. Then breeding scaleless into lavender, the outcome was a little weird at first. People were not getting any like obvious lavenders out of their scaleless lines. Everybody thought that they were going to be getting like a maybe pale blue type of snake or something like that when they were breeding the scaleless into the lavender, but that just wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And finally, after years of doing these test breedings, a sort of hypomelanistic looking scaleless uh, was bred into a known lavender and all of the offspring were lavenders. And that's because lavender is not actually a color mutation, except it is, it is technically a hypomelanistic mutation, but it is uh, more of a scale mutation than it is actually a color mutation. It doesn't really change the color too much other than reducing some melanin, but it changes the scales in such a way that the light reflects and refracts in the scales in a certain way that will prevent us from being able to see the true color of the snake. So what we get is just red and tan instead of the purple tones that we expected. And I did want to take a second to mention that someone by the name of Kinneret Taylor, I hope that I'm saying your name right, I'm sorry if I am butchering it, uh, sent me some messages about the lavender gene mutation and how it has also been found in humans. And it does cause hair to be like completely gray. I'll put some pictures up on the side for you guys. Uh, and it is a really interesting read. I'm actually going to try to find the link and send it to you guys so you can go read it. Uh, it does also mention that there's some changes in the skin as well, which could be why uh, the lavenders without scales are hypo instead of normal. So I'm not sure exactly. I'm not a scientist, but uh, you guys are welcome to go read that information. I thought it was really, really cool that humans also have a lavender gene mutation that changes the color of the hair. And since scales and hair are pretty much made out of the same stuff, it makes sense that the lavender's scales would be gray if that same gene mutations causes our hair to be gray in humans. So very cool information. And uh, it also explains, like I said, in my mind, it explains why they are hypomelanistic as well, because that same gene mutation does affect the skin pigment in some way or another as well. And one other interesting thing that Kinneret mentioned to me is that it affects the way that the liver functions. The liver does not do very well uh, with a lavender mutation mutation in humans, at least, if you are fasting. So uh, we're not really sure how that affects uh, corn snakes or if it affects it at all. Uh, it's the same mutation. It does the same thing uh, with the pigments and all of that, but I'm not sure how it might or might not affect the liver. Um, so that's something that if somebody really wants to tackle a really cool experiment, that's something that you could do. Uh, lavenders have also been sort of known for having kinking issues, and I'm not really sure if that has any Anything to do with this part of the mutation either and not all lavender lines do have issues with kinking it could be just a fluke or just a myth of some kind that lavenders have problems with kinks uh, I no longer breed lavenders because I was having trouble with all of my lavender lines having kinks uh, it was a problem uh, I would breed you know two het lavenders together and all of the babies would be perfectly healthy but the lavender babies would always be kinked and so I just decided to uh, wash my hands of lavender in general but but uh, there are lines out there that do not have that issue. So I probably just got unlucky with the line that I had. Either way, very interesting information. I highly recommend uh, you guys go check out that because it is very, very cool to know that we actually do like know a little bit more about this gene mutation than I originally thought we did. So I hope that you really enjoyed this information on lavender. Uh, not a whole lot of information is new, but I did want to uh, at least go over the history with you guys in this video because I didn't do that in my last video. And I wanted to go over this like really cool news that lavender has been mapped in humans at least and uh, kind of show you that information because that's not information that I had in the last video either. So uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video, which is going to be a Q&A, I believe. Uh, I haven't really decided 100%, but if you do have any questions, for me that you would like me to answer. Uh, I will be going back in the comments on all my YouTube videos and looking for all of the questions. I'll be compiling them and I'll be answering all of those in a video for you guys. Also, before I forget, I will be on a podcast later on this week. I'm going to link that down below. It is the Herpetoculture podcast. I hope that I said that right. I am 
so bad with words. I am dyslexic, so anything that's like not straight up and obvious, I mispronounce. But I will be on that podcast. I'll link all that information down below if you guys want to check that out. And I'll see you in the next video.